who did not join us this morning for a GPL compliance palooza. Uh, we're going to get a little bit more political and technical this afternoon. And um, so let's have Adam start it off. If you guys could put your hands together for him, that would be great. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yep, cool. All right. Um, yeah, my name is Adam Poulton. I'm here to talk about uh, blockchains um, and disintermediation. Uh, I just always like to get a bit of a show of hands. Um, who uses Bitcoin in the crowd? Oh, so about a quarter. That's good. It's a good start. And what's everyone else's experience with Bitcoin? Just zero or you know a little bit about it? A little bit, cool. All right then. So, um, yeah, my name's Adam Poulton. I, um, I started playing around with Bitcoin stuff about four, four and a half years ago. Um, I'm not rich though because I wasn't brave enough to buy um, any coins at the time. I was just learning about it. And, um, yeah, this is a little bit of my CV um, in the blockchain field. So I co-founded the uh, Bit uh, Bitcoin Association of Australia, as it was called, um, in late 2013 with six other people. Uh, current president of Blockchain Association. Um, we changed the name from Bitcoin to Blockchain just for branding, um, branding issues. Uh, Bitcoin, seem, not sure if you know, has a bit of a, a bad name, band, uh, brand and name to it. Um, I stood for Senate in Tasmania as a Flux candidate and Flux, um, I'll explain a little bit more later, but is using um, blockchain technology to uh, secure voting uh, from individuals. Uh, I'm the Tasmanian agent for BitPoz, which is a merchant provider for Bitcoin services for shops and uh, online retailers, and BitRocket, who is rolling out um, Bitcoin ATMs, or as uh, Joe likes to call them, BTMs. Uh, we currently have two, two of these um, BTMs in Tasmania, one in Lo uh, Launceston and one in Hobart. And I believe there's about half a dozen Australia-wide with plans for another dozen or so in the next uh, year or so. And uh, my personal business that I started up, uh, uh, well, I started up two years ago, had a few uh, technical problems, so put it into uh, suspended animation for about two years and that's about to start up again. That's called Get Paid in Bitcoin. And so uh, we've worked out a system so to enable anyone to receive a portion of their wages in Bitcoin. And about six months ago, uh, Lifeboat Foundation contacted me and asked me to be on their board for new monetary systems. Uh, Lifeboat Foundation uh, does a lot of work in the future sphere, so they look at um, a lot of different future scenarios and try to work out policy and um, plans for like natural disasters, um, there's interplanetary um, uh, boards as well, and it's a very interesting foundation. So um, I haven't done much to date, but I hopefully um, can put my name to a few papers on that in the future. Okay, um, normally I start off uh, just outlining what Bitcoin isn't, because uh, a lot of people have got a lot of uh, misconceptions about what it is. Probably not so here, because you're um, all quite technically knowledge. But Bitcoin isn't a company. Um, there's no, uh, no company that's trying to profit from this, this uh, project. Uh, it's not run by a signal organization. A lot of people think there's a database somewhere in um, some, like China or America or something running all these transactions, but that's not the case. It's a distributed um, system. And it's not controlled by any group or entity. Um, a lot of people uh, think that there's a committee or that there's a group of people that have um, uh, profited from, from creating this blockchain. That, that's not actually the case. And even though I'm, I'm president of um, Blockchain Association, I have got no influence on the blockchain per se. So, so that's what blockchain isn't and Bitcoin isn't. And the, these two words are interchangeable as well. So if I say Bitcoin instead of blockchain, um, Bitcoin is actually the biggest blockchain at the moment. Um, there's about five or five, six hundred other altcoins that use a blockchain, but uh, by market cap, um, Bitcoin is, I think, 80 or 85 percent of the entire ecosystem, with those other 700 or so um, occupying the other 15 percent. So um, Bitcoin and blockchain is a new um, internet protocol. Uh, it's the first protocol that's designed to transfer value over the, um, over the internet. 
And this does cause some confusion as well. Bitcoin is actually the protocol and it is actually the token that runs on the protocol. So I can transfer Bitcoins from one person to another on the Bitcoin uh, network. And it's the first time that we've had an immutable and censorship resistant database uh, that is open to the public and open for everyone, everyone to use. Okay, so um, what I'm trying to do with this um, presentation is, uh, well, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about me. I'm not a programmer, so I, I um, see this technology from the outside. Uh, I try to make sense of the technical talk when I, um, when I hear it. And, um, yeah, I, I, I do make pretty good sense of it, I think. But I've, and everyone comes to Bitcoin for a different reason. I've actually come to Bitcoin because of the monetary aspect. Uh, I see a lot of problems with the current financial system, and I'll get into that later. But um, the Bitcoin network actually, in my view, solves a lot of these problems. So that's the reason why um, I'm involved. Um, obviously, I'm not a, a Linux developer either. And uh, for the purpose of this presentation, I also like people just to sort of believe me when I say that um, Bitcoin in particular is a secure network, that it's censorship resistant and that it's immutable. Um, I ask you to go and actually verify that afterwards. Don't trust me, but um, just for the purposes of this presentation, just take, take that on board. Okay, so centralization. Um, way back in history, uh, when people were hunter, hunters and gatherers, we were all living in small communities and people were generally um, generalists, like they used to do a lot of different jobs and you didn't really have speci specialities. Um, obviously as populations uh, grow, uh, people become specialised and so we've got to this stage now in human evolution where uh, we've got specialist doctors that, um, that can do probably a small handful of operations but on your brain, for example, but wouldn't know anything about your feet or your reproductive system. So specialisation is, um, I think, just a normal course of events. And, yeah, like, so we're at the stage now where we've got um, centralised function, uh, centralised authorities for almost every function, um, particularly in government. Uh, there's a lot of, um, lot of centralised power in government. And so, uh, yeah, so we, we need permission to do a lot of things um, and that permission can take various forms, but even like when you're born, for example, you need permission from the government to get a, a birth certificate and uh, like proof of ID. And uh, yeah, just an everyday example of that is a large news organisation. Uh, the the uh, news organisation is the gatekeeper there. Uh, they choose what they publish and they choose the angle that they put on all the information that goes out from that organisation. So what um, Bitcoin was trying to do was decentralise. And a decentralised organisation, um, yeah, it's my belief that uh, a lot of these centralizations were the result of um, limited technology. So it wasn't not long ago where, um, yeah, where we couldn't talk to people on the phone from vast distances, uh, couldn't communicate, couldn't travel that, that effectively around the world. Um, a lot of these problems have been overcome recently, obviously. We've got mobile phones and we can communicate instantly with people all around the world. Um, but we're still sort of limited to a certain extent um, because we don't have a protocol to transfer value and that in my um, opinion is, is sort of the next frontier that we've got to solve and that big Bitcoins and blockchains solve. Um, yeah, Bitcoin's like eight years old now. Uh, you've really got to sort of peer into the future and to, um, to try to understand the, the efficiencies that it can gain. Um, and a little bit later on in this talk, I'll probably um, outline some of the, the things that I see in the future. So, um, yeah, an example of decentralisation is, um, yeah, like Twitter and YouTube. A lot of people use Twitter and YouTube and Facebook even for their news these days. So that's um, a decentralised news source. Um, 
there's probably a little bit more um, due diligence that you've got to do to verify if it's real news or fake news, but um, yeah, like I, I prefer it in my personal life. Okay, um, has anyone heard of the island of Yap? This is a little zig. Yeah, three people. So I really think uh, Island of Yap was a bit of a precursor to Bitcoin. Um, for those people that don't know what Yap is, that, that man there is standing next to um, the money that they used on Yap. So he was quite a rich man if he actually owned that. And so what they did on Yap was um, they used this stone money. Now this stone money wasn't actually native to the island that everyone lived on, it was from an island 450 kilometres away, but what people would do would get a little team together, sail out on their canoe, dig a coin uh, from various sizes, from like football sized up to that size, uh, put it back on the raft and sail it back home and they've created new money by doing that. And something like that for example would probably be worth a house or two houses and what the island and you obviously can't put that in your pocket to move it around. So what they would do um, would be to have a, a town meeting. So if someone wanted to buy a house off someone else, they'd agree on the price, they'd agree to transfer this rye stone from one person to the next, and so they'd have this town gathering. Bob would put up his hand and say, look, everyone knows I own this stone, and they'd say, yep. And he'd go, all right, well, I want to buy this house now, I'm giving this stone to um, Andrew. Everyone would say, yep, cool duly noted in our ledger, in our head, and the deal is done. And, and that, that worked. Every, every time there was a meeting, um, if Bob then turned up and says, oh, everyone, I've got this stone still, and everyone would go, no, you don't. That belongs to Andrew. You can't spend it because it's not yours. And so that was a blockchain because everyone had the ledger in their head as a part of their, their collective memory, and all Bitcoin really has done is put that ledger on a computer database all around the world because we obviously can't remember all these transactions and, um, and, and made a secure system so that people can't create um, artificial entries and award themselves 100 bitcoins when they want to. So, so I see a lot of similarities between the island of Yap and Bitcoin, um, even to the extent where um, Every now and then would, there'd be a storm, so you might have a big rock like this on your canoe, you'd sit, be sailing back home, there'd be a big storm and it'd fall to the bottom of the ocean. The people could still get back to shore, say, look, there was a big storm, we had this massive rock, it was this big, and it fell into the ocean, and they would still use that as money. Even though no one on the island had seen it, except for this probably half a dozen or one dozen people, that would still be used as money. And archaeologists have have compared the stories and then actually gone out and, and found these rocks on the bottom of the ocean and, and they were money and they got used as money even though no, no one had ever seen them. So again, a little bit like Bitcoin because no one has ever seen a Bitcoin because it's digital. So um, yeah, so that brings me back to, to the public blockchain which is a shared database. Uh, the protocol has um, has strict rules and conditions. Uh, a lot of people sort of um, try to say that Bitcoin won't work because someone can just make up their rules and put transactions on the network that, that aren't, don't follow the rules. Um, that's incorrect because the protocol will actually not accept those transactions because they don't follow the rules. Um, the, the records are shared with all the users, so at the moment I think there's five or 6,000 uh, nodes around the world that run that have the full Bitcoin blockchain on them, and they keep that up to date. Uh, as I said before, anyone can participate, um, anyone can use the network, anyone can um, build applications on top of the network. Uh, I believe Rusty, that everyone knows Rusty here, I believe Rusty's working on an application that's built on top of um, Bit uh, the Bitcoin blockchain called the Lightning Network. And so that's just an example of, um, of them seeing a way that they can use this underlying technology, um, make it better with an application that rides on top of it, and uh, release that for people to use and, um, and participate with. And like I said, entries that don't follow the rules won't be accepted and won't be um, put into the blockchain. 
Right, this brings us up to trust. I've got about five minutes less left, so just forgive me if I rush a little bit. I'm trying to, six and a half, and I'm trying to allow a little bit of time for questions at the end as well. So trustless, I hope you can all read that. I don't care how cute they look, stay away, because humans are unpredictable and dangerous. So, um, yeah, blockchains are predictable. You can, like with any code, I suppose, you can um, put a transaction in and you're pretty sure what's going to happen at, at the other end. Um, because they're machines and they run code. Uh, that's opposed to banks or political authorities, where um, banks, as you know, they can suspend transactions, cancel accounts, freeze your, your bank account if they want to. It's all, all up to um, a few individuals on what they do there, and politicians uh, probably more so. And so the trust that, like, when you use those institutions, um, the trust in that institution is really wrapped up in the individuals that that occupy the office or occupy the, um, the business. Um, because we all use these and have been brought up using these, um, a lot of people ask what the risks are, like I use a bank, it works pretty well most of the time, um, like what are the risks of using the bank? Well with the banks, you obviously got fees and charges, uh, then we get into these other areas, politicians, um, the trust in politicians fulfilling their, their promises. Uh, voting, uh, we've had a lot of um, news about corruption and security of voting um, stations in America in the recent election, for example. Uh, assets, um, when you trade assets on the stock exchange, you've got a clearing house and sometimes they're not independent, sometimes they can suspend trades and reverse the clock if there's been a spike in transactions, for example, or a, a bug, they can actually go back and arbitrarily um, cancel certain transactions that they didn't think were appropriate. And, um, and money, the thing that we use every day. Um, we place a lot of trust in the Reserve Bank and uh, the transparency transparency of their processes to, um, to guarantee the value of our money. But, I mean, this is, and this is why I got into Bitcoin. A lot of people probably wouldn't realise, but every day in Australia, um, probably about $600 million is created out of thin air every single day, and that actually steals purchasing power out of the dollars in your wallet in real time. And, uh, and so that, that's a risk about using the currency. And it's probably not so prevalent in Australia. Um, our money does hold its value reasonably well. But when you go to places like Venezuela and Argentina, I think Venezuela's inflation rate is 40% per month at the moment. And that's because their central bank hasn't, um, has, has basically printed too much money and uh, inflation's got out of hand. And, and courts as well, like courts, courts are, um, we put a lot of trust in courts, but there's quite often decisions that we don't agree with. Uh, cost is an issue and time, time cost is an issue. It's not uncommon for court proceedings to drag on for two, three, four, five, ten years. So avoiding risk, and avoiding risk by using blockchains. So um, Bitcoin is used for money and people can use it for money transfers. And so that avoids the risk of uh, banks' fees and charges and uh, central banks and their inflationary um, monetary policies. Uh, Flux, as I, I mentioned before, uh, Flux was running candidates in every Senate it, uh, seat in Australia. And the Flux candidates, if elected, would have actually held their position of power, but basically polled all the members of Flux on each and every issue to and voted accordingly to that vote. So that was using blockchain technology to, to um, guarantee that the votes were coming from an in individual, were auditable and transparent, and that the representative would actually do what the party wanted them to do. Uh, digital assets, uh, so the Bitcoin blockchain can be used to make um, digital assets representing real world goods. Um, there's been digital assets created for gold, uh, oil, and there's like even the Australian Stock Exchange is exploring it to uh, transfer stocks. And that will create a lot of efficiencies, allow, um, allow stocks, for example, to be, be uh, traded peer to peer rather than through an exchange and will reduce costs and fees. And also speed up the process, like actual settlement these days can take two or three days. So like I know you buy them and they're in your account when you do the trade, but if you wanted certificates and certification that you own that asset, that can take two or three days to eventuate. And then the next thing is um, smart contracts. 
um, because Bitcoin is obviously programmable money, um, we can program it to do what we want. So there's, um, there's sort of beta stage projects now where people, for example, might own two Bitcoin and decide that they want to transmit those Bitcoins to their kids when they die. And so that can be made into a smart contract put on a blockchain like Ethereum. And then uh, there's, there's things called oracles. So that contract will actually look into databases. It will know when I die and it will self-execute the will so that my kids get the, um, get the Bitcoins in the event that I die. So yeah, so to summarize, I'm pretty close, bang on 20 minutes. Uh, so blockchains give you a choice. Uh, where in the, in the past there hasn't been a choice. Um, in the past we've had to use money in the banks to transfer money. So now we, we've got a choice. And yeah, it can be between the status, status quo and a decentralized solution, or it can be between several decentralized solutions because there is not one type of money that we can create on a blockchain, there's several. So, um, and it also gives you the choice to participate. So. I know there's a lot of smart people here. Um, yeah, if you want to have an input and you think this is interesting, um, yeah, feel free to put your hand up and um, you can join in. So that'll, um, that'll probably finish all that up. Has anyone got any questions? Yep. Oh. Contracts. I'm curious about what what are these databases that you can look up in? Is this some concept of a trusted database that we simply don't have yet? What what is this like imagined world where these in, contracts have access to data that they can be certain is correct? Yeah. So who's writing the contract could choose that. You could you could say look use Google as your oracle, or you could say look here's three separate databases. When two of them confirm it then you can execute the contract, or we need all three to confirm. So that's really something you can program yourself. And, and like I said, a lot of this is a little bit imaginary because it's really cutting edge, but you can have input into this. Um, you, yeah, but you, you don't have to trust. Like there isn't one special one that everyone has to trust, you choose. Yeah. Does that help? Yep. I was really curious about the flux that you mentioned. Is yep. that a project that's um, built or being built or is in use already somewhere? Yeah, so flux was launched uh, in May last year. Yeah. Uh, it is a private company that's using the blockchain network to, like it's another protocol layer on top. And they're still in development. They're developing their voting app at the moment and they're running, uh, they're running state candidates in Western Australia in a few months time and Tasmania's got some legislative council elections coming up in May, I believe. And so I might be running in Launceston for that, for that as well. So, yeah, so have a look at Flux, join up, voteflux.org. Someone just up the back there. Uh, especially in regard to Flux, I'm kind of interested in the 51% attack. So. With Bitcoin, I guess there's incentive for the network to grow because people get money out of it and they have an incentive. Sorry, I can't hear you. So with Bitcoin, people get money back. So there's an incentive for them to participate in the network, which distributes the hashing power to try and avoid the 51% attack. How is Flux going to get around that? Because otherwise I see a very big potential for someone to go and buy a whole bunch of ASICs and effectively own 51% of the network, in which case they own the ledger. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so at the moment, if you wanted to take over the Bitcoin network and put your own transactions on there. I don't know the exact figure, but it's hundreds of millions of dollars to do that. And so to try to corrupt a few people doing votes on some one piece of legislation that might sway one politician in Australia, I'm not quite sure if that's like a cost benefit that anyone would try to do. Sure, it's, it's obviously something that we need to incentivize, because I mean, if you're planning on using that as an actual democratic process, then yep. what's the protective mechanism? What's to stop that attack? Yeah, well, I suppose um, like the Bitcoin network's worth $14 billion at the moment. No one has, um, the, I believe the biggest hashing pool has got 30% and dropping at the moment. And like I said, it's working <laughs> and it continues to work. Um, I wouldn't put a couple of hundred billion dollars worth of assets on the Bitcoin blockchain right now 
because it's only worth 14 billion, so that would create the incentive for someone to do something like that. But as the network gen gradually grows over time, and as, as it has more um, value, it will get more hashing power and be more secure. So, yeah, I, I'm not really worried about that type of thing. I think there's a slight misunderstanding here. He, he might be thinking about a separate blockchain and who would power that, but I think the answer here is that it piggybacks on top of the existing oh, Bitcoin okay. Sorry, I didn't hear blockchain. That yeah. So actually, in order to vote, you would actually have to pay transaction fees, which the government could subsidize and so on, but it would be the existing Bitcoin blockchain. Yeah, so a lot of these miners. applications are built on top of the Bitcoin blockchain, which has the security. Like a lot, a lot of people have tried to, um, like these 700 other altcoins, they have their own blockchain, but they're not very secure because they're tiny little networks. And so um, a lot of them recent, oh, well, not a lot of them, but a few of them recently have actually been piggyback, like reverting back to the Bitcoin blockchain for the security that it, that it gives you. That's all done. All right, thanks everyone.